Okay, um, we're back. Sorry, my last video um, ended somewhat abruptly. I didn't realize that the um, free version of this screencasting software that I'm using here limits you to 15 minutes um, of video, so this lecture will end up being several short 15 minute long videos, probably about three or four videos. So, okay, um, don't want to waste time. Let's get going. Um, so as I was saying before, um, we're just looking here in this picture at um, a, a synapse between um, a, a, an axon terminal button and uh, the cell body of a postsynaptic cell. So this is that, that's what this image is here. That's, kind of, that's just sort of blown up. Um, here's the terminal button and the um, cell membrane of the postsynaptic cell. This is the um, cell body of the postsynaptic cell. So as we were saying before in terms of describing the um, communication um, of neurons, we described it as an electrical chemical process. The electrical part of that process is the action potential. The chemical part is what we're focusing on here now. So when the action potential reaches the end of the axon, it causes the release of neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are the chemical part of this two-step electrical chemical process. Um, so when the action potential reaches the end of an axon, when it reaches the terminal button, it causes the release of neurotransmitters, these little chemical messengers, uh, little chemical um, molecules. And that you can see they are contained, neurotransmitters are contained in um, what are called synaptic vesicles, these little, um, little pockets that contain neurotransmitters. And so these migrate over to the inside of the um, wall of the terminal button and they sort of fuse with that and then sort of open up this sort of their membranes fuse with the inside membrane of the terminal button and um, sort of rip open and causing them to spill their contents, all these neurotransmitters, out into the synapse. And the neurotransmitters will float around in the extracellular fluid of the synapse um, until they um, possibly bind with a postsynaptic receptor. So there are receptors, let's see, I don't see them depicted in this picture. Synaptic cleft is just another word for synapse here. Um, now we don't have any um, receptors pictured here, but there are um, little receptors or sometimes called binding sites that are embedded within the membrane of a cell. In fact, we're going to talk about um, at least two different types of important receptors um, coming up in a second. So neurotransmitters will float around in the synapse um, until they possibly bind with their appropriate receptor. Um, so the way to think about neurotransmitters is that neurotransmitters um, sort of fit into receptors just like a key would fit into a lock and just like, you know, certain keys will only fit into certain locks and certain neurotransmitters will only fit into certain receptors. So um, the neuro each neurotransmitter uh, and there are obviously um, you know, a pretty large number of neurotransmitters. You've probably heard of some like dopamine, serotonin, or epinephrine um, have to find their appropriate receptor site and they'll only be able to really bind with their appropriate receptor site. And when they do that, if enough neurotransmitters bind with receptor sites, um, that may, well, depending on the type of neurotransmitter it is, um, may initiate an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. Again, the postsynaptic neuron being the one that picks up the neurotransmitters. So the presynaptic neuron is the one that releases the neurotransmitters. Um, the postsynaptic neuron is the neuron that, that receives those neurotransmitters. Okay, so that's you know what we need to know about the communication properties of a neuron um, involving those two steps um, an action potential followed by the release of neurotransmitters which get picked up by receptors we're going to talk about um, you know when we're focusing on the physiology of memory we're going to talk about the role that two very important types of receptors play in terms of learning and the creation of long-term memories um, 
and we're also going to focus on a couple of, um, uh, well, the most important um, neurotransmitter that we're going to focus on. One that is, um, for a while now, known to be really important in the process of learning memory is this neurotransmitter called glutamate. And um, it's appropriately enough named, you can use sort of the mnemonic of thinking of glue, because that's really, um, right, so glutamate, think glue, um, because that's really, in a lot of ways, the way that this neurotransmitter works. It sort of um, works like glue in the sense that it helps synapses to form and it strengthens synaptic connections between one neuron and another neuron. And when you think about it, um, well, if we just go on to this next slide here, this is really what learning is at a molecular level, um, right? We've defined, um, you know, we could, the broadest way in which we can define learning is a change in behavior due to experience, where memory is a demonstration of what has been learned, right? It is the way in which your behavior changes following some sort of experience that you've had, and that experience has left some sort of impression on you. Um, that has persisted, and it's that persisted impression that is what we call memory. Um, and as we've said before in class, you know, memory doesn't have to be just something that is verbalizable and something that is available to conscious awareness, like what we typically think of as memory. Um, things like what you had for breakfast this morning um, certainly is memory, and it's what we mostly typically think of as memory, but that's really just one very specific type. Um, you know, a type of declarative memory, memories that can be consciously declared, but certainly there's other types of memories as well, like skill memory, procedural memories, um, things like that, which aren't necessarily things that you can consciously verbalize, but your memory for these sorts of things is expressed by, through your behavior and how your behavior has changed with practice and with experience. Okay. Um, and so, you know, experiences are not stored anywhere in the brain. So, you know, this is something important to keep in mind as well. Memories are not stored necessarily anywhere um, in the brain. Uh, we know that there are certain parts of the brain that are more important than others when it comes to forming memories, but don't think of it as um, memories as being stored in any one particular place in the brain which I think is something I mentioned in class last time, right? We know that the hippocampus, for example, is important for memory. In particular, the formation of, of um, long-term memories and things like episodic memories. Um, but that doesn't mean that memories are stored in the hippocampus. Memories are really destroyed, um, stored throughout the brain. Visual parts of our memories are stored in visual areas of our brain, visual cortex. Um, auditory portions of um, our memories are stored in auditory um, parts of our brain, auditory cortex. Um, so memories are really sort of um, stored in pieces throughout the brain. You can sort of think of it that way. Um, and let's see, what else do we have here? Um, Experiences, so they're not stored anywhere in the brain. They change the way we perceive, perform, think, and plan, right? And it's the fact that experiences leave this sort of impression on us that they can change the way we perceive, perform, think, and plan that allows psychologists to be able to measure memory because, as we've said before, we, we measure memory in the way in which behavior changes as a result of experience. And what we know about memory, too, is that memory and changes in behavior due to experience um, reflect an actual physical, um, physiological change, structural change in the brain, in the nervous system, altering neural circuits that participate in this act of perceiving, performing, thinking, and planning. So, you know, what's really happening when a memory is being performed is that there's an actual structural change that's happening in the brain that is literally causing you to perceive and think in a way that is different, literally different from the way you 
used to perceive and think prior to that experience that you had. So this is, that's what memory is. So let's start talking a little bit about the molecular basis for, for memory. So memory and learning in general involves literal structural changes in the brain, right? Every time you learn something, your brain is undergoing structural changes. In, the f in what way? Um, in the sense that new connections, or I guess I shouldn't say connections, new synapses are being formed between neurons, and synapses that already exist between neurons are being strengthened. And it's particularly this process, um, right? We do form new neural connections, new synapses as we learn things, but it seems as though the predominant way in which we learn is by strengthening uh, synapses that already exist. And this, this process of strengthening synaptic connections, strengthening synapses between neurons, as a result of repeated experience and practice, is something that is called long-term potentiation. So long-term potentiation is an increase in the excitability of a neuron um, to a particular synaptic input caused by repeated activity of that input. And what that basically just means is that it is a strengthening of a synapse. It's a strengthening of the connections between two neurons. So think about it as, you know, what does it mean for a synapse um, to be weak in the sense that um, if you have, let me see, do we have a picture here? Go back to this picture here showing up our blown up image of our um, axon terminal and our um, post-synaptic membrane here. If this were a weak synapse, it would mean that when this cell was stimulated, um, it, this post-synaptic neuron would not necessarily be incredibly likely to generate an action potential in response to this. So a weak synapse is one where um, when the presynaptic cell fires, the post-synaptic cell is really not guaranteed to fire. But as this synapse strengthens, and we'll take a look um, in a couple of slides about how that strengthening process happens. When that synapse becomes stronger, um, partly as a result of the neurotransmitter glutamate, which as I said, serves, works like glue, to glue the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron, strengthening this synapse, this connection then when this neuron, the presynaptic cell, generates an action potential, it will be much more likely that the postsynaptic neuron will also generate an action potential. And so that, has, that is when um, um, a synapse has been strengthened, and that is when long-term potentiation has happened.